Hey there. Hopefully the visual quality is a little bit better for this video. Uh, I'm using a different kind of camera, but <clears throat> it might be a little bit too little too late. This might actually be the last video of this kind that I make. Uh, and that's just because the, the sort of the time that it takes to make them and the small amount of views that I get really doesn't justify each other. But I don't know. It depends. We'll see how much free time I have in the future. However, if this is the last video that I make, then we're going to go out on a good note because this is an important one. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a series of short stories by an author that I both think are really important and that a lot of people don't know about, but that a lot of people should know about. <clears throat> and um, the, the book that we're talking about today is John the Balladeer, written by Manly Wade Wellman. And yes, you heard that right, Manly Wade Wellman. With a name like that, you should have some pretty high expectations of some pretty ass-kicking stories, and hopefully you won't be disappointed. I certainly wasn't. Um, now, this is a short story collection about a character named, well, John the Balladeer, I guess, but he's also called Silver John. And... Um, this, uh, this title is never expressed in any of the stories as far as I know. It's, it's mostly a strictly um, outside referential name. Um, and uh, the, the character, uh, Silver John, in that way is a lot like uh, Robert E. Howard's Conan character. Uh, you know, you never hear his last name. He's sometimes called Conan the Barbarian or Conan of Cimmeria but you never hear those titles in any of the stories, at least to my knowledge. And it sort of makes him seem like this character who's almost, uh, you know, more than human, right? He doesn't have a surname like we do. Uh, and the um, same thing with John the Balladeer. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting off topic here. So yes, this is a series of, uh, a short, of short stories. And I should mention at this point that these stories can be a little bit inaccessible. Uh, I think if you try to buy uh, buy them on Amazon, you know the books can be pretty pretty pricey. Um, but th they were ori originally published in magazines, and they were collected later. I think uh, the first collection was called "Who Fears the Devil," and uh, that was a, a collection of. Uh, most of the stories in John the Balladeer, and they were separated by uh, what uh, were called like sketches or vignettes, which were very, uh, you know, short, short stories, like a few paragraphs long, uh, that kind of divided the stories. Um, now, John the, ba John the Balladeer has all of the stories from Who Fears the Devil, plus a few other ones, and the vignettes from Who Fears the Devil were gathered together and put in their own sort of chapters full of these vignettes, <laughs> kind of, uh, which was a little bit weird. Uh, but anyway, and I think since then there have been a few other uh, additional publications and collections of these stories as well. But anyway, they can be a little bit tricky to find. Um, I actually uh, read this book through the magic of the internet, uh, but anyway, you might have to read them however you can. Uh, so anyway, that being said, now uh, these stories, they're about, as I mentioned, a guy named John, and he's called Silver John often because uh, he carries a guitar with them, with them, with him. He carries a guitar with him that uh, is strung with silver strings. And uh, most of these stories, they take place in about like the 1960s or the 1970s. John is a veteran of the Korean War. And he travels uh, rural Appalachia, uh, and he, he kind of, uh, he's mostly like a, a tramp, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a transient, a drifter, a king of the road, one might say. But anyway, so he kind of travels the mountains, and uh, he, his goal is he kind of collects folk songs. You know, he learns them, and then he late, you know, later on plays them, and, uh, and that's kind of how he earns his his living is, you know, he just travels around and, you know, plays songs for uh, room and board and, and, uh, and food, basically. Um, but, you know, he's not, uh, he's not incapable by any means. In fact, there are several times throughout the stories where he actually has the opportunity to become rich, but he specifically turns it down. 
uh, because, you know, that's not what he's looking for. And in fact, it's implied uh, every now and then, very subtly, that he's sort of like kind of a, a reincarnation of John the Baptist. Uh, he basically, you know, wanders the wilderness, uh, sort of doing good works for people and that sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, okay, that, that's all fine and good, right? You know, I mean, that sounds interesting enough. But what is, uh, you know, what do these stories have to do with the usual fantasy or sci-fi content of my, uh, my YouTube channel? Well, so uh, as he travels, he, he always encounters something strange. Uh, you know, in these stories, there's always something like, you know, witches, uh, ghosts, um, you know, sometimes monsters, uh, even uh, sometimes there is like time travel or even extra dimensional aliens. All right. It's it's all sorts of crazy, weird stuff that, that he comes across and they're pretty far out, but they're really good. <clears throat> and um, let me just say, I, I love this concept. You know, uh, as, as a fan of fantasy or science fiction, usually when I think about fantasy, I, you know, I automatically equate it with places that are, you know, far off and exotic, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, maybe something based in Europe with its, its castles and knights, or, or maybe even Asia, um, you know, something like that. But here, uh, there's these stories that are, are set pretty much in my own backyard. Well, you know, I... So uh, I grew up in uh, rural Iowa when I was young, and then the Appalachians are pretty far removed from that, but still kind of the same idea, right? You know, they're, you know, a forested area. Um, you know, Iowa's much less mountainous, but, you know, same kind of climate, right? And as a kid, I would always kind of go out in, into the forests, and um, there were sort of these places that had sort of their own kind of magic, right? You know, if you'd get out deep into the woods where there were no other people, it, it had this very, um, you know, sort of quiet sense of, of magical beauty to them. And, uh, but then sometimes on the other hand, it could also be intensely unsettling as well, where, you know, it was very quiet and you'd get to these areas where, uh, you know, the sunlight didn't pierce through the canopy much and it would seem very unsettling at times too. Um, you know, and yes, maybe, uh, you know, the, the North American wilderness doesn't really have the, the tradition of, you know, the kings and queens that you know, the, the old world has. But, you know, we had the, uh, the American Indians, right? And we had all of their uh, very ancient traditions and that sort of thing. Um, so it was really nice to, to see someone take this, this rich and sort of a untapped uh, setting and, and, you know, theme and use it as a tapestry uh, on which to paint these, you know, fantastic stories of, of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, it's a really brilliant idea, and I'm, you know, I'm really glad that he thought of it. It makes, it makes for a very unique and, and very fun reading experience. You know, and not only that, it also kind of has its own unique sort of uh, legends and magic as well. Um, now, I'm not exactly an expert with this, but I think the author, Manly Wade Wellman, he was. Now, the Appalachian regions uh, sort of have uh, or had their, their own brand of folk magic. And Wellman mentions this several times. He makes reference to it. Uh, for example, there are a few times um, in this book, and I think maybe uh, it becomes uh, a little bit more prevalent in some of the later stories, not in this, uh, in, in uh, Who Fears the Devil or John the Balladeer, but he references um, a, a book called The Long Lost Friend, which is also known as Powwows. And this was, uh, it was a real book. You can actually read it on um, sacredtexts.org. Is it a .org or is it a .com? But uh, it was basically a compilation. This guy uh, wrote it. Um, how long ago was it? Uh, it is quite old anyway, probably a, a few centuries, but, uh, anyway, it's a compilation of old, uh, Appalachian folk remedies for various things like, uh, it, you know, if, if your cows are infested with, uh, you know, bot flies or, uh, you know, if, if you have problems with, oh, I don't know, arthritis or that sort of thing, it would give these folk remedies that were <clears throat> kind of a combination of uh, Christian prayers and, and rituals and that sort of thing. 
Um, I, I can't vouch for uh, how well they actually work, but you can try that for yourself if you want. But anyway, so he, he references uh, this, uh, you know, and um, he also makes a, a reference to uh, the tradition of sin eating, which <clears throat> I think are orig originates from Europe. But I think it, I believe it also made its way into uh, America as well. This idea that when a person dies, a living person can take their sins upon himself, so the deceased can go to heaven. He references that. Uh, he talks about something called a, a dumb supper. Uh, dumb, I think, is in not speaking, right? Not as in unintelligent, but this kind of ritual that, um, uh, that a, a young woman could undertake. It was a means of divining where she could basically see a, a ghostly image of her future husband that sort of thing. And so he, he kind of weaves all of these in together with um, sort of his own weird fiction and, and, you know, things that he made up himself. And it, it's a great combination. It really is. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the author himself and kind of my experience with, with him as well. Um, now, I discovered Wellman just recently, but I had actually read him uh much, much earlier when I was like in elementary school. So Alfred Hitchcock, of all people, would put out these, uh, these short story collections. And uh, a lot of them were actually geared towards younger readers. Not necessarily, um, the stories themselves weren't specifically made for younger readers, but, um, you know, they were things that either Hitchcock or his editors or whatever determined were suitable for, you know, uh, young adults or, or younger readers or whatever. But anyway, so Alfred Hitchcock put out these story collections, uh, short story collections. And uh, one of them was called Monster Museum. And uh, it was all about, you know, short stories that had some kind of monsters in them. Um, some of them were pretty weird. I, I remember some, some very strange stories. Like there was one about this boy that turns into a wheelbarrow. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, there was one, and I remember it very vividly. It was called The Desrick on Yandro. And that sounds like nonsense, and that's probably why I remembered that title. But uh, it was about this guy who goes up into these mountains, and he encounters all sorts of crazy monsters. Like there's this one thing that, you know, it lies on the ground, it's all flat, and you can't see it, and then it wraps up and grabs you. Or there's, you know, this one monster that's got this long nose, and it shoots pebbles from it, you know, like a, you know, something out of The Legend of Zelda or something like that. And it was full of all these weird monsters. And so... Uh, just this year, I got to thinking, I was like, yeah, I remember that, that old story called The Desert on Yandro. It was really weird. I wonder if I can find it. And I did. And it was written by Manly Wade Wellman. And so I did some research on this guy and, and you know, learned about the Silver John character, you know, and I was like, oh, it's, it's this guy who uh, wanders the Appalachians, this, you know, war veteran who has got this silver strung guitar that he uses to fight off witches and and monsters and stuff. And <clears throat> I thought to myself, that sounds awesome. Why haven't I heard of this before? And why isn't this man world famous? That, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard of. And so, you know, I, I researched him and yeah, it, it was every bit as cool as it sounded, right? Um, now, if you're thinking that uh, this author is, you know, just some kind of, uh, you know, no name, small time, small time hack, no, he's not at all, actually. Uh, I would say it's more correct to say he's a forgotten author because he was actually quite influential, uh, you know, just like Fritz Lieber, who I talked about in, in another video, uh, in the establishment of, you know, the, uh, the, the fantasy and sci-fi short story culture that sort of permeated much of, um, you know, American literature during the, uh, the, 20th, the, the 20th century. Uh, wrote, wrote lots of stories for short story magazines, was, was very influential in, in that whole burgeoning scene. Um, and in fact, it, it, lest you still doubt, uh, doubt my opinion here, uh, several of his short stories were actually adapted into, uh, they received t uh, TV adaptations. Uh, one of them, I believe it was uh, called uh, the, uh, the Valley Was Still. It was a, a kind of a horror short story that he wrote. Uh, that was uh, adapted into a, a TV episode called The Still Valley for, um, for a, a little TV show known as The Twilight Zone. You might have heard of it. 
Um, and then uh, a little bit later, um, there was uh, uh, Rod Serling, the creator of The Twilight Zone, had another TV series in, I believe it was the 70s, called Night Gallery. <clears throat> if you're a fan of The Twilight Zone and haven't heard of Night Gallery, check it out. It's in color. It's got more of a horror theme. And uh, one of Wellman's stories made it into Night Gallery as well, uh, uh, a story called The Devil is Not Mocked. And then finally, uh, a third uh, story of his called Rouse Him Not was uh, made into a, a TV version for a syndicated series called Monsters. And Monsters was a pretty good series as well, perhaps not as uh, well made as Night Gallery or The Twilight Zone. Uh, definitely has kind of its own flavor of like, you know, 90s, uh, um, you know, 90s hokiness to it, but it's a pretty good series anyway. So, uh, yeah, I mean, oh, and there was actually a movie that was made uh, based on this book I'm talking about. Well, or more specifically, the earlier uh, incarnation of it, Who Fears the Devil, was made into a, a movie back in, I want to say, the 1960s. Uh, and uh, it was later retitled The Legend of Hillbilly John. Now, uh, I did watch about half of that movie, and um, I guess it was, it was a pretty abysmal failure. Uh, it really didn't get much... Uh, coverage or anything like that. Not a bad little movie. Um, I would say it it does a good job in, you know, kind of, um, well, whoever made it seemed to have read some of the stories. It kind of tries to weave some elements of the stories in there, but it's also kind of its own thing. And I kind of feel like it didn't really capture Wellman's vision for the Silver John character, but uh, that's a discussion for another day. Anyway, so uh, so talking about Wellman a little bit more. Um, so he did write lots of stories, uh, just kind of random horror stories. He, the, of course, the Silver John stories. He also wrote a series of stories about a character named John Thunston or Thunstone. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, who is a, an occult detective and he fights off evil with uh, a silver cane sword. And uh, actually the, the um, rouse him not the monsters uh, TV uh uh, series actually used one of the the John Thunstone stories for it. I haven't read any of those, but they sound pretty cool. Um, I think he also did some traditional sword and sorcery with a, a character named Cardios that uh, takes place in Atlantis. I haven't read those yet, but they're on my list. Uh, what else? Uh, I think he even did uh, a story about Sherlock Holmes fighting aliens from the War of the Worlds. Uh, I need to look that up a little bit more, but I did come across that, and that sounds awesome as well. So he was a pretty prolif uh, prolific writer, and I, I think it's a real shame a lot of people don't know more about him. But um, anyway, so let's talk about uh, the book itself and the, the stories. <clears throat> so uh, this uh, the story collection, it's... Uh, so most of these, first of all, they are written from uh, first-person perspective. They're written from the view of Silver John himself. And, uh, well, you know, that that's a risky move. Um, I usually prefer to write in third person because I feel it gives you a lot more flexibility as an author. It gives you the opportunity to kind of, um, you know, play with a narrative structure a little bit. But uh, you know, he did it from John's point of view, and I think it works quite well. Um, so, uh, again, it, it does kind of miss out on the opportunity to sort of do some, you know, some, some interesting prose or some wordsmithing, but it makes up for it by, uh, you know, just with flavor. You know, so John, he, uh, he speaks and he writes with, you know, kind of a southern dialect. Uh, you know, for example, you'll hear him say, instead of saying, uh, no, he'll say nary, or instead of saying ever he, or, uh, every, he'll say air. Uh, you know, so it, you'll hear things where he says like, uh, well, I reckon no man ever climbed that mountain, <laughs> you know, or something like that. And it, it really adds kind of a nice bit of flavor to it. Uh, I think, um, anyway, uh, the short, the, the stories them, themselves, I'll, uh, figure out how to talk in a bit here, but, um, the stories themselves are, are fairly short. They're not particularly long, but uh, that's their beauty. You know, they're just as long as they need to be. Um, if they were any longer, they would maybe be too long, right? But it's just enough that it, you know, uh, you get to know the characters and you get to know the setting. And by the time you're done with the story, you know, you feel like, yeah, that was a pretty good story. Um, 
so uh, there's that. And, uh, you know, even the, uh, the vignettes I talked about earlier, those are only like a few paragraphs long, and those are really good, too. Uh, and I think they're a real testament to Wellman's skill as an author to, to be able to just take, you know, a, a few paragraphs and put them together into a whole interesting story that's, that's fun to read. Um, in fact, the, the vignettes, the sketches are, in a way, kind of my favorite part of the whole book. They're, they're really worth checking out. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, the the topic, it ranges from everything from, uh, you know, well, things I said earlier, right? You know, witches, aliens, all kinds of things. Um, more than anything, I would say the most common theme are, are witches or like warlocks. He probably encounters them more than anything, sort of Appalachian, you know, folk wizards and, and, and so on. Um, but a lot of times in those stories, they're, they're interwoven with something else, you know, such as like a monster or something of that nature. Um, and then uh, beyond that, there are there are a handful of ghost stories as well, which um, were good. I found those are, in my opinion, perhaps the least interesting of the stories, but they're still good. You know, like if you read them by themselves in some sort of like, you know, high school reader or something like that, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that was a good story. Right. But it's just that the others are so much cooler, I think. Uh, and then, yeah, there's a handful of other monster stories. There's uh, one time travel story. There's like a sort of Lovecraftian story, which is one of my favorites in there, I think. All sorts of good stuff. <clears throat> um, now, uh, one complaint that I've heard some people have with these stories is that they can be a bit one dimensional. Uh, John and the characters are pretty simple. You know, the the people that he meets, uh, you know, most of the people that he meets, that they're good people and the bad guys are bad people. You don't see really much moral ambiguity here. You know, it, you won't really find any any villains that, well, actually there is one of them in there. There, there is one story that has like a, a villain who actually turns out to be kind of a good guy. But, you know, for the most part, you know, the bad guys, they, they're just out there to do evil. You know, they're greedy and they want to hurt people. And, you know, the other people are just, you know, purely innocent. And I think that's totally fine. I think Wellman had a vision for his stories. He wanted them to be nice, simple tales of adventure and, and weirdness. And, uh, and I think to introduce, you know, more... Uh, you know, morally complex characters or, you know, ethical ambiguities that would, that would, you know, corrupt them a little bit. It would make them into something they're not. Cause you know, when you go that route, you really have to commit, you have to make the stories about that kind of like the Michael Moorcock Elric stories, right? Good stories, but I mean, they are all about Elric and his, you know, his kind of uh, conflict between balance and, and, uh, chaos, uh, sorry, order and chaos and that sort of thing, you know, I mean, he, Moorcock goes full on with that theme, right? Um, you know, like The Walking Dead as well. Uh, the Walking Dead TV series, I mean, um, l let's face it, that, that series, it's not about the zombies. It's about the characters in it and the things they have to do to survive. And it's a really good series, but at, in the end of the day, it's not really about zombies, right? These stories, they're about the zombies. Well, not there. I don't think there are any that actually have zombies in it. I'm using that figuratively, but you get the idea, you know. Um, I and I like that. I appreciate it. You know, Wellman could have very easily uh, made John sort of a tormented hero, right? You know, uh, uh, you know, concerned about things he's done in the war, you know, and that sort of thing. Or uh, he could have introduced the trope of the of uh, you know the the southern. Uh, a fundamentalist, uh, you, you know, uh, a religious character that, you know, harbors dark secrets behind closed doors, you know, it's, you know, sleeping with his daughter or something like that. But he stayed away from all of that. And I appreciate it because in my opinion, nowadays, that sort of thing has almost become kind of a cliche, right? I mean, whenever I see, whenever I'm watching a movie and there's like some sort of Southern preacher or whatever, it's like, oh, okay, this guy's going to be some, you know, totally twisted evil hillbilly, right? Or something like that, you know, and um, you don't see that in these. Um, and uh, I mean, there's stories that they're there to make you feel good. Uh, John himself, he, he's a very upbeat character. I don't think he ever gets angry in any of the stories, uh, 
the very first one, I think, he starts off by saying, oh, you know, I, I hated this individual. But that's about as angry as he ever gets. It, you know, for the most part, he's really laid back. He, he's just out there to play music and, and have a good time and, and help other people along, along the way, you know. And um, so, yeah, you know, these are stories. They're, they're feel-good stories. You read them, and, and um, it's a nice, simple uh, uh, adventure. And, you know, on that note, let me just take a moment to say, to kind of go off on a tangent here and say, I think it's really sort of a sign that we live in, in comfortable times where, uh, you know, in, in our escape, our, our fantasy and our, our movies and that sort of thing, that the characters are dark and gritty. You know what I mean? Um, prior to like you know, the, the 80s or so, I mean, all the superheroes and everything, they were just good guys doing good stuff. Well, for the most part, again, you, you did have characters like Conan, you know, who are much more, uh, you know, less black and white, but more gray. But, you know, for the most part in like pop culture, good guys were good guys and bad guys were bad guys, you know. And uh, and I really think, you know, ever since the 80s, there's become, you know, and especially during the 90s, there was more of this focus on, you know, gritty and edgy. And I really think that's an indicator that... Um, you know, we live in, in comfortable times, despite all the craziness that's been happening in 2020, right? So, uh, you know, hey, we should probably be thankful for uh, the time and the place where we live, huh? Uh, but anyway, on that note, so I guess that's pretty much all there is to say about this book here. Um, I'd recommend it. You know, again, if you kind of feel like you might be turned off by the simplicity of the, the characters, then maybe this isn't for you. But otherwise, check it out. They're great stories. They're very imaginative. And uh, I think you'll like them as much as I do. And if you do, um, spread the word. I, I, I really wish uh, Wellman was, was more popular than he was. I think he's a, a writer who had some great ideas. He was an interesting person. And he really des deserves a lot more fame uh, than I think what he ended up with nowadays. All right. Anyway, thanks for, uh, thanks for watching my video and maybe I'll see you next time, but who knows? Okay. Good.